Hello everyone and welcome to the Mountainside Podcast. For this episode, we have traveled from Wyoming to sit down with avid outdoorsman and wildlife biologist Patrick Rogers. Patrick plays a key role in the Migration Initiative to help raise awareness about migration patterns of large game animals. I enjoyed sitting down with Patrick today and I hope you enjoy the listen. Thank you so much for having us up in your neck of the woods, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, this is a beautiful country up yeah. here. I forgot how nice it is. Like, I'm always just hauling ass through here to get to <laughs> Tetons, you know? Most people are, man. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, you pass through this windy city and you're like, what? Is there anything here? But we got some good I guess wild I used to country. come up here and uh, hopefully my wife's not listening to this, but chase some women around at the university, Uh-oh, you know, yeah. being a Colorado you wouldn't, kid. You yeah. wouldn't be the only one. <laughs> But uh, we, oh man, we've got some awesome mountain biking and cross country skiing and uh, hunting and fishing just like right out our door. So great. So we're pretty lucky here. And most people, they just, yeah, they blow through, man. They're on their way to somewhere else and yeah. doesn't seem like much, which is, it's good for us who love to play, call this place home it's and keep it small. Much, yeah. Keep yeah. It, keep it to a minimum on it's, here. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> No, it's crazy, man. Uh, every time I cross that Colorado Wyoming border, it, the kid comes out in me because I'll admit I was a bit of a pyro as a kid, and then I went into r- the rock and roll industry, right, which okay. has a ton of that stuff in it. But the first thing is like fireworks. Uh huh. Yeah, I, right on the right, the big like yeah. black cat. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. I um, thought you were gonna say, man, as soon as we cross the border, it's like just the wind just nails you. Which well, that too. We but, always joke that as soon as you drop off from laramie down towards fort collins it's like oh man there's no wind it's beautiful it's calm it's not snowing yeah so yeah no it's crazy it's a diff- it's a bit of a different element up here for sure totally just a little bit yeah but, totally but it's still nice you know it's good. you know what you just you gotta embrace the wind and you just gotta put a put a jacket suck it on up, man. literally right yeah like the norwegians say it's there's no bad weather just bad clothing you yeah. just suck it out oh that's so, so true man yeah. yeah it's all about being prepared for it right yep well man i'm sorry to dive off on fireworks and wind you know leave it to me a rock and roll party animal <laughs> to talk to a biologist about fireworks i but, thought that's why we were here man. Know, okay. <laughs> so. cool man well, well we'll get into that maybe on the way out so, sounds good uh on a serious note uh you know let's talk about what you do your sure. biologist wildlife biologist for the most part correct yeah. Studied in that. Yeah. So I just recently graduated from the University of Wyoming, um, got a degree there. It was more of a research degree. So I spent four years uh, co-leading research on uh, mule deer migrations. So our unit, we have a unit within the university. It's called the Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, co-op for short. Um, and what we do is focus on mostly projects that are looking at big game migrations. So this word ungulate, meaning hooved animals. So elk, moose, bison, um, those kind of critters. So we're, we're trying to study and and track movements and, um, get a grasp on these big epic migrations that we're starting to uncover in the West here. Um, which Which is crazy. We haven't done that. I mean, there hasn't really been too many studies prior to what you guys are doing, right? Like, I mean, very minimal. Right. Yeah. So it it has been pretty minimal. I mean, there's been like, so like some of the hunting community and the ranching community has had a grasp on some of these migrations for many years. Um, but we've never really documented, uh, these movements using GPS technology, which is what we have now. So like it's come a long way. Yeah. It's come a long ways back in the day. You'd have to go out and like put an ear tag or a, a color coded collar on the animal and ex- and like hope you're going to find the animal. There were animal. no game cameras like 20 right. years ago or yeah. anything like that. It's insane. And now we can just put a GPS like you've got on your cell phone around the animal's neck and like get a ton of data for you know uh for like 24 hours in a day for two or three years and and know where this animal is pretty much at all times, which is pretty impressive and allows us to 
uh, finds out some really cool stuff about animal movements. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's crazy just going back to that. We have up where I live, there's a pretty heavy lion population. We had a neighbor, uh, a couple houses back, a little bit further tucked into wilderness, I guess I would say, as much as evergreen can be wilderness area. <laughs> okay. um, and a bunch of their kids' toys w- were just missing all the time. And they oh, were like, like in the backyard, like balls, basketballs, footballs, right. all that sort of stuff. So they thought some... One of the neighbor kids was coming in, maybe stealing them, pulling a prank or something. Uh-huh. So they put up these game cameras, and it was a lion that was coming in and no way. taking the kids' toys. Stashing yeah. toys. <laughs> That's crazy. Not what right? you would expect yeah. for it's like, a lion oh, wait a snake. minute. Yeah, yeah. while well, I'm sleeping, yeah, uh-huh. by the way. Um, yeah, so that, that just going back to not get off, I didn't fully answer your question. Yeah, but, no. Um, yeah, so we're mostly looking at animal movements and that kind of thing. So I just graduated last year with my master's degree. Um, and that was on this project that was one of the first in the West really to track, um, buck mule deer movements. So a lot of the work that's been done with migration has been done on females on does. And that's for a number of reasons. Does are easier to capture. They don't have this big set of headgear yeah. that like can poke your eye out when you're trying to, <laughs> to capture them and put a collar on. Um, and then they're also, does are just the best indicator of population performance. So how's, how are the herds doing? Um, and so that's why, and they're also the future of, of the population too, right? Exactly. Because they're going to calf. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so you've got, you know, one buck that can, inseminate a bunch of does so the bucks aren't as important reproductively in that sense um so really the focus has been on on does so our study um was started by a biologist in a little tiny town in southern wyoming um and he was like how come we haven't looked at buck movements you know like why has nobody done this so he put some ear tags that had these unique numbers on them and people were, uh, he put them on some bucks and he found that people were like spotting his bucks south into Colorado. So they'd moved from Wyoming south, like down towards the town of Steamboat. Um, Really? That far, huh? Yeah. It's a ways. It's a, it's a bit. Yeah. A little, a little bit north of that. Um, but, uh, they were making these big, like 60 to 80 mile movements. And so he was kind of like, Oh, maybe there's something, going on here um and so he uh works for the game and fish his name's tony mong and he um got with matt kaufman uh who works in our unit who's a researcher and they started this study looking at um how bucks move and got a bunch of collars on these animals and and um started seeing these same things that he had been seeing with those ear tags like and how does Colorado and Wyoming game and fish communicate? I mean, there's got to be some sort of like, there's a ton of animals that migrate across, yeah. including wolves, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. deer know no, yeah. you know, they don't know boundaries like we do. Exactly, um, so yeah. they're crossing state boundaries left and right. Um, I mean, it's just like wolves that have made their way down yeah. um, into that country now. Uh, you know, they just it's there's it just happens it yeah, just they happens yeah they don't recognize so, borders yeah. yeah so wyoming game and fish department does has a great relationship with um colorado uh fish and wildlife and so they're or parks and wildlife and they're communicating and they um we've worked with those guys down there directly and they've helped us um pick up some collars from animals that may have died down there or um, get permission uh, from landowners to go access um areas to capture deer and things like that. So there's a lot of communication that goes on there, which is in some ways what had made that project pretty unique and cool was that like, it was this interstate collaboration, which you don't see it a ton of. Um, usually it's like States trying to figure out, Hey, what do we got in our state? Um, and try and get a grasp on that. But this was like a cool, um, interstate effort, which was, which was fun to be a part of. That is really sure. cool. Yeah. What are the, I mean, have you ever lost a collared animal to a hunter? Has that ever been an issue? Or yeah, so do, and what are the rules? I don't, I've never had that come up. I guess where Good I question. hunt is a yeah. bit more wilderness area, so uh-huh. I feel like a lot of those animals aren't 
I, or I don't see collars or ear tag. If I see an ear tag, I, that's not true. I saw an ear tag on one cow and I didn't shoot her because of that very reason. I was like, yeah, yeah I just, I didn't know the rules. No, it's fair. Like, I think my initial instinct would have been the same. Like, uh, like I don't want to mess with this. Like, but unfortunately, like that is a common thing and uh-huh. we don't like biologists and the state like they don't want to interfere with hunting you know like they want to just let that be a natural part of the whole man I mean, that's kind scheme, of the funding you know? for what you guys do too i mean in, in the same sort of sense right like a lot of the yeah, times or the yeah. state anyways yeah so like um mealy fanatic foundation was a funder of our project um so there's uh definitely you know hunting interest um we had a, a commissioner's tag which i don't know if you've heard of those like uh, the Game and Fish Commission can donate a tag to be put up for auction so people can bid on that tag. And if they get it, they can hunt um, one of like three species anywhere they want in the state, mm. which is pretty cool. So um, we had a, a, a guy, Mark Anselmi, donate one of those tags and we got uh, money for our project from that, which is cool. That is um, really cool. But yeah. Um, we were talking about. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, really good at sidetracking yeah, people. Cool. So Jeremy will keep us in line too. That's yeah. what he's here for. Thanks, Jeremy. And, You're and the man. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll do my best. But yeah, we were so, talking about migration. We were talking about collared animals. Yeah, and if and you if, can shoot a collared yeah. animal. Yeah. So like generally, we just like it happens a bunch. So that was actually one of the big um, challenges of our study was that, gosh, I think it was like. 60 i want to say like 60 percent of the bucks we had collared um were harvested by it was it was a high number it may not have been that high but a bunch of bucks were killed by hunters which is what we expected as part of the deal yeah um we don't ever want to discourage hunters from you know people that are listening to this that maybe don't hunt that is part of the process that is part of game management and conservation is hunting is a big plays a big part in that conference conservation exactly so, it's, so the animal populations aren't overpopulated correct? exactly yeah. yeah so game and fish doesn't want to discourage folks from harvesting animals and trying to reach those harvest quotas that they've had so they can hit a certain population objective um which there's a lot the of science that, that goes into it yeah. too and i'm sorry to jump back no. and interrupt you but it's a lot more than just like we issue this many tags every year. Right. Every year it changes and yeah. fluctuates and decreases. I mean, and every year those guys are out there and fixed wings and helicopters counting animals, trying to get a grasp on how the herds are doing. And those numbers are adjusted every year. So, you know, they've got a, a given herd and they say like, you know, how, one, how's this herd doing? Two, how's the habitat and can it support you know, X number of animals and they have like a really good grasp on that. So they want to harvest some animals, um, so that they're not, I mean, basically animals that are over a certain capacity. So to where the habitat can't support them, um, you're going to see overwinter, uh, loss from starvation and things like that. So they're trying to hit a certain management objective and saying, yeah, like we want hunters to to kill a certain number of animals and for people that don't hunt like i I can't speak for wyoming because i don't think i've ever hunted up here i I, for a fact i know i haven't i have in montana but uh but game and fish will call you and ask you i mean they literally call everybody that has a hunting or fishing license on a big game animal and say hey did you harvest or it's a a survey at the end of it and if you miss that call like i've forgotten to get their call the first ring they'll uh-huh. call they'll pester you man they'll oh, call is that you how back. they do it in colorado and they call awesome. you wow. yeah they yeah. call you up and they want okay. you actually talk to a person you say yeah my they'll ask how your hunt was do you think there was too many hunters huh did you harvest wow. an animal how many animals did you see how many hunters did you see it's crazy that's I mean, cool that they call you for that it's, yeah it's all up here in wyoming it's all automated um or, or through the mail you can do it online or in the mail okay but you're right like they do hound you because that information is like pretty important for them to estimate like oh we had this many hunters on the landscape like this many people harvested people were satisfied with their hunt people were not satisfied um they're, they they want to keep close tabs on all all of that stuff so. yeah no i think it, they got a great program going down there and i'm sure it's, cool. it is up here too so yeah, yeah they're doing a heck of a job up here for sure yeah 
Yeah. How much out of state money comes from that? You think? Uh, you know, there was here. a. Is yeah. it a big? I mean, Colorado, it's huge, like a lot. Yeah. No, it's a lot. Um, and you're putting me on the spot because yeah. there was a, a well, study we got done. Jeremy here too can help us look it up. Yeah. So there's spots, a so. study done uh, a few years ago, um, and I think it was sponsored in part by Pew Charitable Trusts, and they um, found that like tourism, and especially tourism from hunting and wildlife watching, was like huge for our state. It was like one of our main econ- economies and it's it's exploding well you, you guys know, got so. yellowstone grand tetons and then everything outside of there right which is right it's pretty a huge much draw. all of western Wyoming. i mean i love coming here in the spring uh-huh i, I love to take photos of animals even more nice. than hunting you know yeah and, nice uh, yeah and man being in the tetons with that backdrop and being able to go right out to the bison or sea it's prong horn, it's awesome man. you can't do yeah. that anywhere else yeah You'll have a couple other people, you know, Few shoulder to shoulder. Around. Around. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 unbelievable what we have here, and Colorado's got some of that too. Um, it really does. Not, yeah. You know, not the same with it's the a grizzly different level of country and, though. Like, yeah, yeah. But you guys got some intense alpine, just cool, cool country down there. Um, big mountains that we, I mean, we have that in the northwest part of the state, but yeah, you know, we've also got a lot of flat sagebrush which is one of the reasons like we can we're home to so much wildlife is because like these big sagebrush basins that people drive through on i-80 and they're like oh there's there's nothing out here you know those are some of the best areas for wildlife especially in winter um winter so, range yeah yeah exactly so um in the spring uh when or i guess in the fall in the high country when the it starts to snow and the high country gets a bunch of deep snow animals like deer and elk uh, and moose bighorn sheep they can't hang out up there and and try and survive moving through that deep snow it's really taxing they're not going to find any food so a lot of them move down in elevation to these lowland areas and that's where they're finding food and that's how they're surviving the winter because um, there's not as much snow. We got this awesome Wyoming wind that blows a yeah, lot of the snow blows away. All the snow into Colorado um, or yeah. Nebraska, right? Yeah, so, whatever, so to the Wyoming folks who curse the wind, <laughs> think about all the wildlife who are benefiting from that clearing out food for them uh, to eat. Uh, so, yeah, like these big expanses of of habitat are what support some of the big herds that people love to come see and hunt up here. And that's 18.4 yeah. million acres of BLM lands. Uh, that's $88 million in salaries and wages, $331 million in sales, $24 million in state and local tax revenue. That's a 20, lot of money. $24 million in federal uh, tax revenue. That's pretty good. That's and awesome, that's just man. 2,600 uh, jobs. Just BLM just lands. Just BLM lands. Oh, that's not even forest. Yeah. yeah. Or state. Or, yeah. National, yeah. That's, that's great. cool. Yeah. Yeah, Good so stuff, it's, man. it's a big deal for sure up here. Yeah, uh, especially we we had um, it was a previous podcast that we were talking about, and uh, we were talking to forty year veteran from Colorado Division of Wildlife, great guy Perry Will, um, and he was put it in perspective, just uh, the influx that we're seeing in Colorado. Uh-huh. He was like the entire population of Wyoming is the population of Lakewood, Colorado, like oh the city. Gosh. Yeah, and it's a suburb of Denver, you know oh, what I mean? Man. So, so to have that outside money, I'm, I'm sure that helps with pay for a lot. Yeah, know? it's huge. I mean, we're really like an energy-dependent state for sure, but wildlife and tourism is also huge for us and is really important, and we have a special resource here um, that I think we can really capitalize on for – um, the future. And that's why, I mean, that's why like game and fish work so hard to keep tabs on numbers and why we do the work we do is so that, you know, future generations can come here and see these animals, you know, because they rely so heavily on these migrations and these, um, seasonal parts of their so life cycle to survive. I'm sorry to interrupt you. How yeah. long has this study been going on? How long have you been at it? And what what have you guys learned? I mean, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's the study I worked on started in, in 2015 and it ended um, in 2019. So we've wrapped up 
most of the study and now we're just publishing our findings. Um, but I, I came in winter of 2015, 2016, and my job was to be like the, the Wrangler grad student who's like, all right, Pat, you're going to come in, you're going to, you're going to sleep in, uh, Tony, the biologist camper, and you're going to help capture a bunch of these deer and it's going to take Good luck. months. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> see you later, man. Uh, so, um, uh, so that was the plan. And, uh, what happened is, and our goal was to catch like that first winter around like 30 bucks. So we wanted to get callers on 30 bucks and we used this technique called drop netting. So it's like you set up a big party tent, like you'd see at a wedding, something like that. Um, and it's got these poles, but it's all got netting on top. So, um, you throw out the deer's favorite treat, which is like crack for deer. It's apple pulp. It's like just ground okay. up apple fiber and you throw that out and the deer, they come in, they're on winter range and you drop this net with a, a remote you're sitting in a truck or in a blind and when that net falls on them they get entangled and then um, a team of biologists and volunteers run out jump on a deer secure it um, are and, you guys using any sort of tranquilizers or anything like that? no or? so that's uh one of the beautiful things about really? this method <laughs> is <laughs> it's dr- a wild animal yeah with, it's drug yeah. free and it's like um and it's really safe for the animals wow. so I got a whole new level of respect for you, too, man. <laughs> are, they, are they drunk off that apple pulp? <laughs> yeah. It's like it's a little nip, something, right? something. <laughs> no. So I, I think, like, people – that's one of the things, like, biologists get a bad rap for, and especially guys studying migration and movement, is, like, they see captures like that, and they think, like, oh, we're really, like, stressing these animals out. We're, like, you know, we're – we're, we're harming these animals. And the truth is like, it's really, it can appear like violent from the outside. Like, Oh, you're dropping a net on them and like they're bouncing around and you're jumping on them to secure them. And it's like, it's in a lot of ways, it's pretty gentle for as tough as these animals are. And the stress it puts on them is really limited. Um, so I got to ask this next question before we go any further. (laughs) Has there been any severe injuries or people get stuck or, I mean, especially with a buck, human injuries or yeah, human injuries, um, not, uh, not from the work that we've done. Okay. No. Yeah. And that's like, obviously one of those things like safety is the number one priority first, um, for the people and second for the animals. Um, so like, thankfully nobody's, um, been Sorry, hurt, I been hurt. Yeah. No, great question. If you watch the uh, film that we're going to talk about in a bit, uh, there's a scene there of us releasing a deer and one of my colleagues, uh, got a nice kick to the chest from this doe who was that, like, yeah. see you, man. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like safety concerns that go into that, but thankfully no eyes were lost in our study at least. But, um, Anyways, yeah, it's it's quite a scene of like just people running out and securing these animals, and then um, we'll fix the GPS collar to the animal. Um, and some studies like we want other measurements um, just to monitor deer health for animals that are being captured over and over. Just for our study, we just wanted to look at movements, um, so we just put that GPS collar on release them as quickly as possible. So any of the like negative effects that you would expect are, are pretty low. I kind of imagine as like a play session with like a wrestling session with your dog, you know, like that's about as intense as it is, or like taking your dog to the vet, you know, um, it's, it's pretty minimal. So, yeah. So anyways, we, we started this study and my goal was to go out and capture all these bucks. And that was going to be my field work. And biologists are like pretty, uh, I don't know. We covered our field work because that's like what gives us life and stuff. It's like sitting at a computer all day is, is pretty life sucking for me. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, no, it really (laughs) is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like my hope was to go out and just like spend some quality time and in the outdoors and with these animals and collar these deer. And that year we had just like a huge dump of snow and 
and this was on winter range, which is usually like pretty sparse with snow. So that can really stress out animals that can stress deer pretty hard when there's deep snow. So we just backed off because we didn't want to stress the animals out. And we came back with the helicopter, um, towards the end of the, uh, the winter when, um, snow had melted off and we used a helicopter and this thing called a net gun, which is like something out of like a Batman movie. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Sounds like, fun. yeah, it's like the thing you dream of as a kid being able to, <laughs> to go around and play with. I don't personally do that. Are cool. And it, it yeah, just they're, in their they're own okay. Brain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I don't do any of the capturing with the net guns and stuff, but we hired a crew and, uh, th- they went out and finished the captures for us, which, um, was awesome, but it was a bummer for me cause I didn't get any of that field time. Um, and that's actually where like the idea for this film came about was because I wanted s- some field component. Like I wanted to be out there and like see the landscape and see these habitats these animals are using and get a sense of like what migration is like. Let's just incorporate the film into it. Cause I don't yeah, want for sure. It's an awesome we film can, and I was fortunate enough to see it before it's released. It's going to be released at the beginning of April, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, middle of April, April, middle of April, April 14th okay. or somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So coming up just around the corner, um, if not out already, uh, and the film is called 92 Miles, correct? Yeah, 92 Miles. And you kind of took a different approach to it. There's a couple different messages in there. One is almost a personal message from right. you, right? And some connection with family. And I'll let you dive into that. Sure. But then the other part of it is the work and uh, what you've studied in this migration patterns and how both stories kind of blend together a little bit. And I don't want to spoil or alert <laughs> this for anybody, but yeah. it, it's a great documentary. So really well done yeah thank you and and props to shannon and the folks at cold collaborative who are the producers of that um it's it's got a lot of pieces like kind of as you hinted at it's got this research biology uh side to it but it's also and then it's got the uh, the athletic side to it with the run um and yeah i totally this, missed that <laughs> yeah and and then this story with uh my dad which we can get into too but there are all these different pieces which made it like kind of a tricky story to tell you gotta see the film we can't explain it you gotta it's true. see it yeah you just gotta watch it um yeah so i where do you want to start with that so let's go ahead and finish i want to know what you guys learned in in your studies with the migration patterns and then we can kind of maybe tie that back into sure. your dad and you and for sure and your personal, uh, I guess struggles with what just life in general and, yeah. and the run and what that meant to you, you know, just sure. I, we'll try to fit it all in okay. this hour and a half. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Yeah. We'll give it a shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically what we found from that study is we'd collared those bucks and then we had a colleague, um, Hall Sawyer, who used to be my boss. He's a great researcher. One of the, prominent researchers in migration in the West. He had a study, um, with, uh, does that were collared that, and he shared his data with us. Um, so we had does collared at the same time as bucks. So it was like this perfect setup for us to compare movements and see like, Hey, we know all this stuff about does and how they move. Like, do they move, do bucks move the same way? What are their behaviors and, and things like that? Um, so we did this like side by side comparison of like what we knew were these key behaviors of migration, things like timing, um, how much time they spent in like their core habitats, um, and how far they were moving, where were the, they were going, how they were using food on the landscape. And so we could l- compare those things side by side. And we found that a lot of, bucks were doing a lot of the same thing that does were, um, which was cool. But then we found that bucks were also having some showing some different behaviors too, that, um, maybe we wouldn't have expected. So like, um, in the fall when, when snow came in, uh, bucks that had to migrate farther were starting their migrations earlier. So they were trying to bail out of the high country and kind of get a head start. Like they knew what was coming. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So like, 
just to give folks a sense of how far some of these animals move, um, the deer in our study, the longest migration was like 106 miles. So some pretty big country. Yeah. Um, I mean, the longest recorded migration is 242 miles, which wow. is a long old ways. Um, so some of these movements are, are pretty big. Some, you know, most are falling in the ballpark park of like, um, you know, 20 to 40 miles or something like that. So was it the more seasoned bucks that were moving further, like the more mature ones or we didn't, we didn't quantify that. Uh, okay. we didn't necessarily look at that. We, we tried to age most of our deer, um, and so that we could look at some of that, but we didn't quite have enough, uh, data to do, um, that, but it was, so we don't know if age was a thing. Um, but all of the deer we captured were mature bucks. So they were three years or older, um, and some pretty nice, pretty cool looking, uh, racks for guys who are interested in, yeah. in deer and horns, um, Look, and antlers some deer running in the backyard right now. <laughs> There's no surprise. Yeah. yeah. A couple dozen of look like a yearling yeah. coming off the hill here. Eric, cool. Eric gets deer in this, <laughs> in this area all the time. Um, yeah. So that, that was kind of like the, we, the main thing we found with, uh, bucks and does and, and them doing some little different things. The other thing we wanted to look at was does hunting season affect how bucks move? So like if anybody's been out on opening day, who's a hunter, you know, like the pulse of human activity is huge. It's like, it can be huge depending on where you're at. Well, I mean, just for example, this year I'm a archery hunter and specifically for elk is what I enjoy to hunt. And this year I noticed for the first time in Colorado, the elk barely bugled if they were in a wilderness area. And I think it was my personal opinion and talking Uh to some biologists it was the influx in visitors that we had over the summer with COVID, right? Mm. People mm. were out recreating more. So there was just a kind they of were a consistent, yeah, yeah, being activity. pressured. They saw the calf numbers, I mean, diminish hmm. tremendously um, because of that pressure. Yeah, saw- and then there was a lot more people hunting because I think that they had more time on their hands, right? Uh-huh. So yeah. I think the pressure was just there to where the elk were just eerily quiet, man. It's it possible. Was, yeah. yeah, it's definitely possible. I mean, that it's plus we had fire, so it pushed hunters out of certain areas too. Sure. There's a lot and of other areas. There are yeah. a lot. That's it's hard to measure those kinds of things. Like we, you know, hunters who are on the landscape, we we're picking up data too. You know, like just being out there, but it's hard to like get a grasp. There are so many different Variables, factors. You yeah. know. And like, that was one of the things we tried to do with our study was like take into account these different factors. So we measured like the weather and snowfall and the distance these animals had to move and, um, like yeah, human activity and things like that. We tried to get a grasp on what was really going on on the landscape and see like, okay, when hunting season starts, like these deer, you know, are they going to just start migrating because there's so much disturbance or, um, what are they going to do? So most of the hunting that takes place, at least in our study areas in the forest, um, or down in like some foot foothill type areas like sagebrush and patches of Aspen and, um, taller stands of brush that deer can feed on and hide out in. Um, but there's like this big, pulse of human activity for about 12 days and deer would typically at least what we've seen with does is like they'd move out when the snow comes um but what we were wondering is like well if if there's so much disturbance kind of like what you're hinting at with the elk like oh the elk just shut up this year (laughs) because there were so many people um like did that activity push uh these deer to like move down to their winter range Um, and what we found is that that didn't actually happen. Um, and one of the reasons, um, we attributed that to was because deer in our area had enough roadless areas. And so they could move to these areas away from the poles of human activity because most hunters in our area, in this study area are hunting from 
motorized vehicles. Which is so, illegal, by the way, right? Well, well, so you can drive to that <laughs> point, but you have to be out of your truck or your. Yeah, you've got to be like 30 meters off the road if you're going to shoot. Correct. Yeah. But in this area, you get a lot of guys who are out. They're looking for deer on their ATVs, in their trucks. And I mean, it's good for the deer because, a lot, you know, as soon as that pulse hit, what we found is that deer were moving to areas away from roads where they could find refuge where hunters weren't as likely to get out on foot and go, um, and go find these animals. And, uh, another one of my colleagues who's actually down working with CPW in Colorado now, um, he was in my unit, his name's Brian Lamont, and he did a cool study on elk in the same area. And he found like rifle hunters just aren't willing to like, get off their ATV or their get out of their truck and like really hike in. Whereas like some archery hunters are more likely to do that. Um, and we were looking in my study specifically at rifle hunting to see like if, if that had an impact. So guys were hunting, you know, off these road networks and, um, Wyoming game and fish department, the forest service have done a good job of like keeping, a matrix of like roadless areas and roaded areas that, uh, these roadless areas act as refuge for, um, these animals, or at least that's what we, uh, kind of suspected, like why we weren't seeing animals migrate down to their, they're smart, man. They're a lot smarter than people give credit for. Unbelievably smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, those were kind of the main findings there that, that we found from our study. Um, yeah, it was, what was the most, uh, was there anything that was like a shock that you guys discovered? It was like, oh my God, we didn't know this, or we didn't realize that deer migrated that far. Or we thought they migrated a lot further. What was the biggest yeah. shock value? I mean, Wyoming Game and Fish has like a pretty good grasp on how these animals move uh, in the first place. We were more so like looking at like these, you know, like with these GPS collars, we can get pretty detailed movements. Um, like we dialed some of ours in to get a location for the animal every hour. So like we could, you know, the data is really detailed. Um, whereas like Game and Fish has, has more of a broader view of, of their movements, but they had a pretty good grasp on them. So there was nothing like earth shattering, you know, as far as, the movements go, um, or or our findings. Um, I think, I think for me, the, maybe the, the surprising thing to see was like that deer were actually using these roadless areas as refuge given like from my perspective, I'm out there and I'm like, there are a lot of roads out here. Like I would expect these animals to move. Like this is a lot of activity and, I'd expect them to like bomb down to lower like elevations. Get out of the area. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean it seems really intense, but they don't really need a lot. You know, it's like uh, they needed like 500 meters, you know, to away from a road, 500 plus meters to get, um, you know, just away from that activity, and that'll show you just how much like hunters, road hunters, are willing to move sure. for an animal. Um, so that, that was maybe surprising to me is just like, wow, like this is roadless a- enough and it works. Um, so yeah, maybe that was the, so I got to ask this next question, you know, a little bit about your background. Why biology? What, what made you get dive into this yeah. specifically? And did you grow up in Wyoming? Is that part of it? Yeah. So I grew up in central Wyoming, a little oil town called Casper. I mean, all all the towns in Wyoming yeah. <laughs> are small, man. Um, so we grew up there and my dad was a wildlife filmmaker. Uh, oh, really? yeah. That's so cool. he, he actually grew up in Oregon. Um, and he, he started out like as a cameraman for like bow hunter magazine TV. Um, and Larry Jones, who some of your listeners may be familiar with who are hunters. Like he, Larry Jones taught my dad how to, how to use a camera, um, and showed him the ropes on that. And it kind of just blew up from there. He started doing stuff for like ESPN, um, ESPN outdoors, Nat Geo, uh, outdoor channel, some of these bigger name, uh, companies and, uh, fell in love with this idea of like being out in the wild all the time. And, um, 
telling the story of of wildlife and wild spaces and he, being from Oregon he like which is a pretty cool uh, place for wildlife and the outdoors he was like Roosevelt elk I mean yeah, yeah it's pretty awesome they got some great yeah. country but for him like Wyoming was like Valhalla you know like the un, the last untouched in the lower 48 like some of the wildest spaces and so he moved our family out here um uh so that he could film wildlife and hunt and fish and raise a family in like wild spaces so that's what we grew up with was like hunting fishing camping like my friends were going to disney world and i was like well we're gonna go camping this weekend yeah and, hell yeah and fishing that's uh, how i grew up too because yeah. i grew up with not a whole lot of money so right. it was like same. that was the least expensive thing to do you know yeah same so like and the most rewarding right to me still yeah. is to this day i you can't tr- forget you can't disney, trade that for i don't want to go there <laughs> Don't tell my yeah, wife that. Maybe no. for the pineapple <laughs> soft serve or whatever they got yeah, there, but uh-huh. that's it. That's yeah, it. <laughs> no, like, that's, we didn't grow up with a lot of money either, so, like, being an independent filmmaker isn't the most lucrative of uh, professions, so, like, we just didn't have a lot, you know? Um, we, we definitely... Is that why you didn't follow your dad's path and dive into film, or are you still kind of on both sides of the fence on Man, that? Or? picked up on that pretty good yeah. no so my dad would always say he's like don't get into the independent filmmaking business don't get into the independent filmmaking business get your degree um and like because he just saw i think for him it was like such a burden to see like his family and say like oh, i can't like i can't take them on a nice vacation i can't get them the things they want and like i think i mean you're a dad yeah i'm a new dad but like you want to take care of your kids and like give them it's the important world, man it's but. important to me uh at the same time i i look back at it and i'm like am i am i giving them a handicap by just giving them whatever they want all the time right. and, and not making them have some adversity like no we're gonna go harvest a deer because that's yeah. how we're going to eat for the right. next six months or, or whatever, you know? So like part of me is like, you, you want to do both, you know? And I didn't grow up with a dad, but I grew mm. up with grandfathers and uncles that, mm. that taught me those sort of things and those sort of values. And, right. and it was always about, they taught me how to be a good sportsman, how to be a good steward of the land, take mm. care of the land and, and take care of the animals and, be ethical and just all those things. So I'm very fortunate that I grew up with that, without a father. That's invaluable, man. It totally is, man. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast was to specifically, I see so many people moving in and maybe they want it. They want to be part of the mountain life, the mountain culture, the mountain system. Right. Right. And they want to hunt. And I'm all for that, dude. Like a hundred percent, as long as you're doing it the right way and, and not ruining it for, the thing I'm most concerned about is future generations. Right. So you have yeah. a kid, I have a kid. Yep. I want their grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandchildren to be able to, to walk into the same streams that I did and fly fish because my family's done it for years. I mean, right. they homesteaded part of where I live now. Really? Yeah. Wow. Cool. Which is really cool. That's but awesome. so that's important to me to keep that. That's why we live there and yeah. that's why we love it. And it, it's that whole, you can go fly fish, you can go hunt, you can, right out of the back door that's I mean, awesome. you know yeah. so well you started with that to me. that value system and those ethics and that was like your your basis for like every you know for how you approach the outdoors and like what you're going to teach your kids and i think i mean we are losing a lot of that i think which is too bad um i mean we see it all the time like when we're out and people just like you know trash the place or just don't take time to just like be still and soak it in and respect it. Like the, yeah. we're miss we're losing a lot of the respect I think for, for wild spaces and like we need families like you <laughs> to like raise kids who are going to teach people like, Hey man, like don't throw out your shit here. Like don't throw out your trash. Yeah. Like, and uh, respect this, you know, respect this place. I or mean, as or much fun as we to, have on this podcast and as much, shit as we talk and bullshit and drink and all that that is the main message of this is yeah we don't want it to be so like it doesn't have to be so serious either Mm -hmm. man like you can Mm -hmm. get the point across 
and still have a good time. It's oh, not like sure. you have to be one or the other, right? Man, it's the, just, it's just, there it to be enjoyed. It comes down to respect. Yeah, you know, it exactly. Really does. It's the, like, and I think that's part of like, that's part of the thing is like having some sense of ownership. Like you said, like, you know, you, in your backyard, you had for generations, like your family grew up there. So you feel some kind of like ownership, not that you own the land, but to say like, this place is a part of me and my family. And like, I want to keep it nice for the future and for yeah. other people too. And I'm this, like, I'm the same way. I'm all for people going out and man, it's been super busy <laughs> these days. With I think COVID, a lot of but, that too is comes down. I'm sorry not to interrupt you, but no, go it comes it. down to us as individuals raising our hands saying like, Hey, listen, I've been fishing the same stream for, my whole life yeah. and 40 years, not yeah. 40 years, probably 35, right? Yeah. It's probably five years old. Maybe before that I had a fishing pole in my hand and I'm seeing it just get hammered and right. hammered. Right. And I'm the last guy that wants to have a trout fishing season. Uh huh. Yeah. But it's like, at what point, like there's some spots that we used to go and just, Nobody it was, was epic, there. right? Yeah. And now you can go there at midnight, 1 a.m., and the flow's still going. It doesn't ice over. So these trout are not getting any sort of, oh, man. you know, there's just a lot of pressure that the, the yeah. state has grown a lot. There's a lot of influx. So I think a lot of it does come down to government agencies mm -hmm. and the people that we put in power and not to make this political, no, for but sure. we need to think bigger and broader rather for than sure. just like, am I doing my, my part by picking up my trash? Yes, you right. are. But it goes beyond oh, that, man. It's totally. like biology it's work, you know, listening to scientists and, Right. And not putting, not putting uh, biology at the ballot box either. Mm. I think is important. You know, to I think leaving it up to professional people that know what they're talking about. You said it, man. Yeah. Um, I think, I'm sorry, I'm going yeah. on a rant here, but <laughs> no, I I I appreciate that. I think, yeah, I think it starts small with like just that respect and and care, you know, for these areas. But the big level changes are are the policies and, and things like that, that are going to help protect some of these areas. And you know, the thing is like, we can all have our cake and eat it too. I totally 100% believe that. And I don't think like this shouldn't be a battle of like, um, you know, biology and environmental interests versus industry, energy, ranching, whatever. Like we can do all of these things and, the landscape has shown us in some ways that it's pretty damn resilient to our activity. Really, we've made a lot of mistakes know? and we've bounced yeah, back from those. Totally. And they're and learning lessons. You and know? some areas will never bounce back. We've totally screwed, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but like we, we have these areas where we found we can make it work and we can have energy ranching, all these land uses and we can make it work. Like I drive a car, I heat my house, I do all these things, you know? And so like, we have to have some of that, but we live in this country that's just full of over consumers and we just want more and more and more. And it's not, it's crazy it's because those same people that complain about like certain things like that, like save the economy that, or I'm sorry, save the ecosystem, that sort of thing. I'm thinking economically too. They're also the first people that will line up at a Starbucks and fill up their plastic cups and then right. go to the shell station. Oh, and we pump all do oil. it. Man. Yeah. We so, all do it. So, it's so the there's thing. gotta yeah. be some transparency there, right? You gotta really yes. look at it from an outside. I think we, view. yeah, I think we have to ask ourselves like, how badly do we want it? Like how am I willing to give up X to have like these wild, awesome spaces and to like have these for generations. Um, and I think like it's going to take some, like it's going to be a tough pill f for us to swallow. Like if we're going to keep some of these wild spaces like that allow huge epic migrations or like that allow sustainable recreation fishing. Um, I mean, just to get a know, permit to go hike somewhere is a, that's an absolute bummer, but I get it. You know, like if it, yeah, there's too many people going into it and you're going to ruin it for the right. future, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. We went down this path. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to your background and yeah, just, sure. you know, uh, we were talking about ethics and value and family and how much that means. And we started talking about your dad. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. So like, like we were saying, like we didn't have a lot of money growing up. So <laughs> our recreation was outside and like, 
we you know if sunday rolls around the weekend rolls around we were out fishing or camping or whatever and it's pretty affordable if you don't have a lot of money uh at least in wyoming to go do that so that's how we grew up and it really instilled in me this passion for the outdoors and this love of wildlife and wild spaces um and secondly like i mentioned my dad was a filmmaker so one of the things he wanted to do was make this uh series on on wildlife uh particularly in wyoming um and in the west and so he would interview like biologists from all over wyoming and the west and um you know we'd be in the the studio i'd be at home and he'd be like playing back all these sound bites from biologists and like I would sit there and just kind of like soak that in. And, uh, for me, it was really attractive to like, well, one, I just was so engaged and interested in it, but, um, that field and that, that line of work was really attractive for me as, as a kid. Um, so that's kind of where that, what a cool way to grow up, man. You, just, you don't realize it when <laughs> you you're don't doing realize it. Like, that's it. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely thinking back, like I, what a blessing in my life and just so so cool to have that um and so that's where like this passion for um wildlife and conservation started and for me is like you care about something you you want to protect it you know you want to keep it around uh so that's where i started to pursue a field in in biology that's that's where that started um yeah and my dad was really the the driving force behind that um we, you know, we were out, uh, hunting and fishing together and just, that was our quality time. It's was great on time the land. to spend with yeah. your, with your family too. Oh, and you make memories that you'll never forget, you know, yeah. as you know. Um, so yeah, that's where it really started that, uh, desire to do something that would help to give back from like all that I had received out on the land. Um, sure. Yeah. It gives so. you that sense of giving something back yeah, and contributing. For sure. Uh, it's all part of the circle. So in the film, um, and I'm going to let you speak on this, you, you went on an ultra run to kind of understand a migration pattern. I'm, I'm going to butcher this right now. No, I'm going to let good. you go. Let's it's dive a, into the film and kind of the yeah. premise behind that. Sure. So... Yeah, kind of the idea for, from the film started like back when I was saying like my field work had gone to shit and I like wasn't there, I wasn't going to get any time in the field and I wanted some way to do that. But I also wanted some way to like tell the story of migration um, and tell the story and, or give people like an on the ground sense of like what migration looks like and what these deer experience um, as they're migrating. Um and so like, do you think your dad having a film background kind of inspired like, Oh, hey, I should make a film about no this? doubt. Yeah. I mean, my dad and I were talking on the phone about like, what could we like, what could I do to like get people engaged and get them to care about this issue? And like one of the most common forms of like, I, I guess human experiences is suffering. Like something we can all relate to is suffering as humans. Like, nobody can escape suffering on this earth. Um, and for, in my mind, like migration though, like my goal is not to go out, especially as a biologist and not like anthropomorphize or like put my emotions on these animals and say like, Oh, this, these animals suffer as they move. But like this theme of like, like it, it is, it is a suffering in a sense of like animals moving from when they're on winter range, a lot of them are like starving to death. So, you know, they've, they've eaten through their fat reserves, um, and the snow starts to melt and this green new life comes up and they're making their way like miles and miles through the back country. Um, and they're just trying to survive, you know, as we all are. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to like find a theme that I could suck people in with. Um, and so that theme of suffering was, was like the catcher. And at the time, like I had just started dating my now wife, Lily, and she's like a big runner, 
marathoner and she was we were both starting to get into ultra running uh quite a bit we had done a couple races um and i thought oh this would be a cool way to tell the story is to and to experience the land is to go out and and run one of these routes one of these uh, migration routes and move through the mountains and be able to see these places that um the deer use uh, specifically deer that i had called it was a great way to tell the story i think you hit the nail on the head because you're running the migration pattern which is 92 miles correct right yeah yeah and you're telling your story as that journey happens and the adversities that you face and i don't know it captivated me man it was cool that's why well, we're sitting here right now so. yeah and you know just the way life is or I don't know if you believe in God, but I, I certainly do. The way God works is like I, you know, I'd chosen this theme of suffering and I had no idea the suffering that I was about to experience um, as we were preparing for this film and getting the idea out there and gearing up to get people behind it. Um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer um, and so like I, put the whole film idea on the back burner and just As like, you should, man. Yeah. yeah. And tried to just like, and I also put it out of my mind a bit. Um, like I got, gotten some initial feedback from folks and was kind of working through some of those ideas and changes. Um, but my dad was always like a huge supporter of the film and he's like, you got to do it. Like you got to follow through with it. And then, so he got sick and, um, for me, like everything else was secondary. Um, cause like just to spend time, time is with so him. valuable, right? Exactly. At that point, especially at that point. Um, so I think you did the right thing, man. For oh, sure. yeah. And I guess if I had any <laughs> regret from the whole thing is like, I wish I would have spent more time with him. Um, like life short and like just to be with the, the ones you love. That's, that's the most important thing I think in life. Um, yeah, so he, he was diagnosed with cancer and it was pretty mild at first. We thought he was going to push through it. Um, and that was, uh, in January of 2017. And then the summer passed and my wife and I were, um, getting ready to go on a big backpacking trip in the wind rivers. I, if anybody's been there, just incredible awesome country. back country. Yeah. yeah. One of the farthest places from roads in the lower 48 is up there. Um, and we were getting ready to go to the trailhead and my brother called and was just like, Hey, don't go in. Like something's wrong with dad. And, um, he, the cancer had spread to his brain. Uh, so yeah. It, and that was just like for us, like for me, just like, you know, I was just like, what, you know, how do you process or, you know, make sense of any of that? Um, I'm still processing it. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we, uh, it was four months later and, and my dad died, but that four months was just like grueling. You know, he went from, my dad loved to hike and cross country ski and he had a, he had a beer belly, you know, and he knew yeah. it and he would like embrace his beer belly, but he was like pretty, he was re really healthy. Otherwise, like he was skiing or hiking like five or six days a week, um, and just to see his like condition just like tank was just for me like uh it was brutal um and imagine. yeah so i i tried to spend as much time with him as i could and and take care of him as did my mom and my brother um but yeah it was it was rough like it was definitely uh the toughest <laughs> part of my life um and he yeah so he passed in december of 2017 um and the following year is uh when i did the run uh in september of 2018 so um and that's pretty recent it became, yeah. yeah and it became like a it gave you a lot more of purpose right from what i saw from the film like it exactly was, yeah so that's where i was talking about that double meaning kind of came in like yeah there was a there was a moment for me when I was sitting down with one of my buddies, Ben Crashour, who's a, a filmmaker. Um, and, uh, he's uh, also a Reddington rep for folks who love Reddington. I do. I'm big. Yeah. Reddington fan, yeah. <laughs> um, tell him to hook well, me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
we were sitting down over coffee one day and just talking about film ideas and there's kind of a moment where I was like you know what forget this like whole running film like let's let's think of something else and um we were sitting down and I was just laying out ideas with him and, he, and uh he's like like man you got to do the run like you got to do the run like it's for your dad you know like your dad is such is so tied into this, like the story so dynamic, like you got to do it. Um, so that's when like we started to resurrect this thing and cold collaborative got on board, which was awesome. And they got did a, a great job with it, by the oh, way, man. They Shout out it. to Shannon yeah. and those, that whole crew, man. That's, yeah. And he's a good film. Shannon brought in some, some awesome guys. Um, Zach Ramress from Sweetgrass Productions. Um, and just a great crew, of of guys out there on the film uh just some epic cinematic stuff there's um, a, the cinematography is aw- the story is one thing but then there's a whole nother level to it with the cinematography and the aerial shots and just it's cool I and mean, maybe that's the photographer coming out and me a little bit oh, for but, sure but i pay attention to that stuff man so well yeah i mean these these guys know their stuff they're yeah. they're they're yeah they do some great work so uh i think folks who are like you who like photography and are visual are, are going to love it. Cause it's just, it is a visual experience, the whole film yeah. for sure. So back to the run, you, you face some serious adversity during that run, right? Like just mental, the men, the mental toughness that I go through to run six miles is is a lot for me so <laughs> see <laughs> so this is I the can thing only i imagine <laughs> what 92 is like I, I get this a lot people are like oh like you know as doing ultras it's like oh, i'd never be able to do that like i don't know what that's like but like that that like suffering is like i mean you or who like it doesn't matter what level you are how far you're running like you can still experience some of those same things and like you're pushing yourself you know it can be freaking hard <laughs> to like have to run you know six miles or whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter and, I, and i'm like no like people will watch the film who are are true ultra runners and like do all these epic races like i'm not i'm not in that front wave elite group who's like yeah there are things there are way more epic and intense things but that people that have done. But that was not the but purpose for, though, right? right? I mean, no, it wasn't exactly. a competition. It was, it wasn't a competition. It was, it was all about the experience. And for me and, and, um, where I was at to go out and like experience that land and like do it in a way that in some ways reflected how deer would move. So like when deer move, they're not just like booking it between summer and winter range they actually take their time a lot, which it it, like some of these migrations can take weeks and even up to a month, um, or, or, or more. And so what they're doing when they move is they stop at these places called stopover sites. And it's basically like, you know, when you're on a road trip and you stop at the gas station and you grab a snack, I mean, they're just like really mowing on the snacks though. It's like their favorite restaurant or like they stop over and just eat as much as they can to gain these calories. So I wanted to kind of show that. So I split the run up into three days, about 30 miles a day. Um, and I would stop and camp and refuel and rest in between, uh, in between runs. And so it was kind of to try and like parallel how deer would move. I could have, just done it in one shot, you know, through the night, made it super, even more burly and epic and, and dangerous. Um, but yeah, the goal is really to show like how deer move, um, and, and try and emulate that. Breaking the ultra run up. And you had mentioned that you had only just got kind of into ultra running and running that far. Had you run 92 miles before in a, in a three day consecutive thing? Like what no. was, did you do so, any sort of training or work up oh, to get to that point? Yeah. So there's a lot, a lot of training. The farthest I had run was 50 miles. Um, and that was in the big horns for the big horn 50 mile race, which was a total shit show and another <laughs> story for another day. That's a gnarly race it though. We rained, know about that. Oh, yeah. it rained 11 hours straight before oh the race so it's just like a mud serious mud fest um 
so that I had done that and then I'd done the Leadville 50. Um, I didn't actually finish. So that's another story. I was at a uh, mile like 38 and I just like was feeling super lightheaded and having a hard time catching my breath. And it's like, something's not right. Um, sat down on a rock and like could not catch my breath and was just really like something's wrong. And thank God, like this group of climbers was driving down this rugged road that the race was on and they're like, you okay? And I was like, yeah, I think I need a ride back down to the med tent. If you guys can get me there. So these guys gave me a ride down. And by the time I got there, I was really having a hard time breathing. And, um, my body was just starting to shut down. I had more or less worked myself oh, into a hole. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was hypoxic. Like I, my hands were turning purple. My face was going numb. Um, is that just not enough oxygen in not your enough, blood? Yeah. Not okay. enough oxygen. Um, I was dehydrated. I I was hypoglycemic. I wasn't getting enough sugar or calories. Um, everything had just like, so this had to be in the back of your mind while you're running this 92 miles too. Exactly. Right? Like, and there, and there's a reason I'm telling this story is cause that was actually a big part of it. Um, so like I, at, in that med tent, man, like I just felt myself like going, I don't know if I was going to pass out or, um, or where I was going, but, um, they got some oxygen on me and, um, I ended up having to go to the ER, getting a couple of IVs and that boosted me back. Um, but it was pretty darn scary, uh, experience and made me just realize like, I'm not invincible, like shit happens and it happens really fast. Um, so as I'm running the 92 mile, uh, run, the first day was just like this huge climb over 10,000 feet, um, this 10,000 foot pass. And, um, I kind of expected like our camp, the, the point was that our camera crew would be able to come back there on this ATV trail. And it was so rugged that they couldn't get back there in time, um, with the ATV. So I was alone for, uh, the first good chunk of that. And, running down the backside of this huge mountain, dropping down, it was like 2,500 feet. Um, my hands started to tingle and get a little numb. And I was just like, oh, it's like, is this a repeat of like what happened when I was in Leadville? And is this um, the first leg of that? So it's the, the first, first leg. Miles? This is day one. Wow. And I was just kind of like, start, like starting to get anxious and a little panicky. I get off the mountain where, where I was supposed to meet my aid crew. I had a support crew of, um, my like closest friends and, and family. Um, and they weren't there and I was just like, Oh shit. Like this is bad. Like they didn't make it. Like what if they're not here by nightfall? You know, what am I getting? All these things running through your head. Worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was getting scared there and like, thankfully, just as that was happening, um, our producer Shannon like came ripping down the road on the ATV, but it was kind of like a bummer for the film because that first section was just like, so beautiful so epic, and yeah, epic, that. just this huge climb and to like see the country that these deer move through is just like, wow, like it's impressive, you know, some of the feats they they undertake to move to find food and survive. Um, so yeah, that first day was just some cool epic country, but thankfully to, to, to scout the whole run to see if it was something I could actually do. Um, we had brought in some horses, Ben masters, who a lot of people are familiar with from, um, unbranded and the river and the wall folks. Have you seen those films? I haven't. No. Yeah. Great conservation kind of base films. Sounds um, like I need to check them out. Definitely check them out. Ben's a great guy. I haven't met him in person, but he was cool enough and kind to, to send us his horses from, uh, those films. And, uh, so Ethan Forrester, who's kind of now a buddy since, since then brought these horses and helped us scout some of that country. So 
if you watch the film, you'll get to see some of those huge, epic, grand, you know, high alpine uh, shots in, in the film still, um, even though the crew missed him during the, the run, unfortunately, just because it's so hard to get back in there. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's another quick – we'll dive off onto that real quick because yeah. that was a piece of the film – which I think is pretty cool. Um, so this this route I ran like would have been impossible to run off trail the whole way because there's so much like I I don't know if you remember downfall downfall and, yeah. yeah when we had that huge beetle kill epidemic like back in early 2000 or it's like around like 2011 yeah it crushed the entire um, Rocky Mountain range man I yeah mean, all the way up into Montana. Canada. It's huge. I mean, yeah, it's huge. So you can imagine like trying to run or move through that is like, it's impossible. Um, so what I did was like, I took the GPS data, um, that I gained from the bucks we had collared and I connected like all these single tracks and two tracks and, uh, some gravel road and some off road. Cause there was just no trail to try and like follow, um, this one bucks epic migration route um, through the mountains, and then I so joined. So you didn't pick the easiest route; you picked the roughest. No, one. I, wa- <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to pick a route that like really showcased like what sure. some of the country these animals move through is like, and what these migrations are like. Um, so it starts in like this big, you know, eleven thousand feet high country, just um, beautiful alpine stuff and then moves down through the forest down to winter range which is like six thousand feet um but then i connected the run with like this broader corridor where all these bucks move through so uh just because there was a lot of private land that one buck moved through i wanted to keep it all in public land so we showcase a lot of public lands which is great um yeah uh and just to show too how important public lands are for these migrations to persist. Um, I think that's important for folks to, to know. So that's something we tried to convey a little bit in the film as well. Um, but were you crossing private property at any point or was it most of it done on public land? Yeah. So the entire, uh, route I ran was public land and that's awesome. Basically like the first 60 miles were like really tight with this one buck and just following kind of his movements paralleling like as close as I could get, uh, to his movements and then jumping into the broader herds, uh, corridor, like the a corridor is basically an area where a lot of animals move through or migrate. It's the so, I 70 of deer migration. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah they, okay. It's a perfect yeah. analogy. So I, I jumped into that to, not have to deal with like getting permission from landowners and things like that. Um, but yeah, most of those deer in that area are moving through public land. So it was all, so that brings up the land. importance of public land then for sure. Yeah. I mean these, like if, if these areas, so one of the things we found with deer and migrations is like, if the disturbance of the development is high enough, like deer have been mule deer at least have been, are so like ingrained and keyed in on their routes that they don't often reroute. They just like, what do we do? Like I've been doing, you know, this is what I, this is where I was taught to go. Like, I don't know what to do. So they just go through the disturbance. Um, and they, what we found is they speed up. So what's happening is like, if you've got it, you know, however many mile wide section of development now would a fence be a disturbance like even if it's public land there's still some fences up yeah there's still grazing purposes right right there's still plenty of fences and stuff and stuff so yeah those that's another issue too but i guess like a development like a housing development we just watch deer come through the subdivision yeah yeah right and deer that aren't used to that like say that pops up one year they don't know what to do so they just move through it quickly and they're missing out on foraging opportunities it can be extra stress and things like that and then they're also increasing their risk for uh getting tangled in fences i mean deer hit by cars hit by cars i mean that's these are big sources of mortality for migrating animals um and one that was one thing we tried to highlight in the film was there are a lot of challenges that deer face when they 
when they migrate. So yeah, you've got roads, um, and those are on the rise. We've just got more people, you know, on roadways and stuff. So deer number deer dying on, on roads is just increasing, um, deer getting caught in fences in some areas like where there's high migratory traffic. They estimate that, um, up to a deer per year per mile, one mile of fence is killed, um, in, in areas with high sorry, traffic. Say so, that again. So, deer? <laughs> so what, for every, for every mile of fence, uh-huh. one deer is killed every year. Wow. So, it, it, and when we're talking about the fences on the landscape, at least in Wyoming, that aren't, is that specifically bob wire or are we talking like any sort of fence split rail? I mean, is that, yeah. So there are, so like barbed wires, barbed wire and woven wire, are like some of the worst for, migrating animals which is the cheapest and the most effective yep. to keep cattle keep livestock in and, and there thankfully there are a lot of ranchers who are just doing an awesome job of converting these fences to wildlife friendly fences that help animals move through more safely and it's not just ranchers it's groups like mealy fanatic foundation and sportsmen's groups and um state agencies government agencies who are converting these fences to make them easier for wildlife to pass. Um, but there are still just a lot of fences out there that some of them aren't even in use anymore, you know, but there's like, there's still a chance for deer to get tangled. It's almost worse too, to me when they're on the ground, especially when I'm in some of the country that I hunt, which some of it is private. Um, when I'm hunting deer, like around home, and I'll be walking and literally the same piece of bob wires caught me like five or six yeah. times until <laughs> like, I literally just went back and I asked the I landowner, it. I was like, can I just rip this up? It's not right. doing anything, but, but it's just on the oh, ground. So you don't I mean, see it. There's it's not tons in front of, of your out face. There. You know? yeah. 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 So, I mean, that was one of the things on the run, like that I saw was there are some old fences like that, that are huge obstacles. But I might, I must say like one of the things that I didn't get to talk about in the film was just like this area, my study area is actually an area where ranchers, state agencies, um, energy industries are like working well together to actually limit these obstacles. And the deer herd in this area is actually doing pretty darn good compared to the rest of the West and, and the rest of Wyoming. Um, in Wyoming alone, deer mule deer numbers have dropped by over 40% since 2000. So we're like approaching this 50%. Do you think some of that has to do with apex predators, like reintegrating wolves or any, I mean, are you guys seeing some of that? Did you catch any of that on your, so, so I can't speak from that from, from my position and from the work that we've done. Um, but what the research shows is that it's not just one factor that's causing these declines, but you've got a lot of things like drought fire suppression, which reduces habitat quality, um, disturbances from humans, mortalities from roadways and, you know, all the predators, all these factors hunting, you know, there's so many different factors that, um, are affecting numbers and ability of animals to move that it's hard to, get a grasp and say like, it's if just, we change this one thing, right. it's just not that one thing. Yeah, right? it's, it's, that's just not how it works. And this um, goes back to my point. Like we should be listening to biologists and that sort of thing. And sure. these studies to, to figure this out instead of turning it into a public affair, I guess. Yeah. It's, so I, yeah, I, I mean, you said it. I, can't, yeah. I, well, off, I'm going to say off, it. So. <laughs> you don't have to, but Perfect. I, that's, that's my opinion. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of work and a lot of research that's gone into this and we're really starting to get, you know, a grasp on all these different factors that are influencing herd health and the that's he- a great health point, of these populations. a great perspective that I think a lot of people don't miss and you just, I've heard it several times because of the work that I'm trying to do and educate right. myself and hopefully this is educating other people. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's in a bit of an eye opener that it's not just one factor. Yeah. It's easy for us to just choose a scape, scapegoat, you know, say, Oh, it's predators. Oh, it's overgrazing. Uh, it's plastic you know. straws. It's whatever. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. It's a lot of different factors. And so like, 
I got to give a shout out, honestly, to like the managers and the ranchers and our areas. Like I, when I was doing this run, like I was seeing a lot of challenges for migrating wildlife, but also like areas where ranchers had laid down their fences, which is one of the strategies to let migrating animals move through seasonally. You can lay down the fences when there's a, a lot of, uh, traffic for, for wildlife. I was seeing a lot of that. Um, I was seeing some great habitat that the state has worked to restore. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of good work that's going on out there. We just need more of it. I think if we're going to see, uh, migrations like this persist, uh, into the future. So yeah, I, that's a kind of, kind of a little tangent, um, yeah, from, no, from the great. run in the film, but, um, yeah, that was the whole point for me was to go out and to kind of see some of like, what are these deer facing, um, while they're out there, but yeah, so it's great. I urge you to go check out the film, whether you're an ultra runner or hunter, uh, there's some great sponsorship behind it. I mean, some big companies got behind it. If you want to drop their names and, uh, we're burning up the time here, man, I don't yeah, want to take no, up too much right. more of your time, but, yeah. uh, can you tell people before we jump off what the film is? Sure. Yeah. Who's behind it, For sure. um, where they can find it, where they can follow you on social and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So the, the film is sponsored by Yeti and Sitka gear. Um, and those guys jumped on board and, uh, thanks to our producers, at, our producer, Shannon Vandeveer, uh, cold collaborative. He really worked hard to make this film happen. Um, and, and dug, dug deep to make it a thing. So, um, the film will be, uh, released in mid April and folks can find it online. Um, and the exact platform hasn't been nailed down yet. Uh, but, uh, just search. We'll, we'll, we'll share it once awesome. we get the links. Yeah. Just send yeah. me the links and we'll get uh, our social team to put it out or whatever. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a great film if you're interested in, in horses and running and, backcountry adventures um if you're somebody who's struggling with the loss of a loved one um if you're an ultra runner if you're a biologist it's we kind of if you're not any of those things like, just check it out if you're into mountain it, scenes man it's exactly cool. it's it's pretty i'm pleased with with how it came i think people really enjoy it for sure i did i'm lucky i got to see it before it's actually <laughs> out so lucky me but uh uh, if people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you, do you have an Instagram sure. or does your, do you have a foundation that you're working with now? Yeah. So right now I work with Wyoming migration initiative and our goal is to educate folks on migration science. And, um, if people want to learn more about migrations, they can check out migrationinitiative.org. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, the whole nine yards. We're producing some pretty fun, cool content that people can like see these migrations. We're, um, on the ground through cameras that we're putting out. We're also animating their movements, um, through mapping. Like if people want to learn more about migrations, we got some really cool stuff out there. So migration initiative.org, um, check it out. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having us up here. Yeah, and, thank you, uh, Bobby. the border a I'm, little bit. I'm glad you made the trip and didn't blow through on your way to Jackson. Yeah, man, <laughs> so. I didn't even see a tumbleweed. It's pretty nice today, actually. So it is a yeah. nice it is a nice day for Wyoming. It's a nice yeah. Wyoming yeah. afternoon. No so. tumbleweeds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks again, uh, everybody. Thank you for listening, Jeremy. Good over there. All right, Jeremy's all good. Uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for listening to the Mountainside Podcast. If you haven't had a chance to do this already, please take a moment, follow, like, subscribe, or rate on whatever platform you catch the Mountainside Podcast at. Also, if you'd like some more information on upcoming episodes, safety tips, access to all of our affiliates, and all the badass discounts that we get here at the Mountainside Podcast, check out themountainsidepodcast.com. The Mountainside Podcast is now available on Patreon. If you'd like access to bonus footage, behind-the-scenes content, ad-free listening, and much more, simply find the link in our bio or visit patreon.com forward slash the mountainside.